Welcome. Um, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome to another week of agent training. We're glad you're here. Today we're talking about title and we are joined by Laura Paul and Cheryl Davis from First American Title. And uh, I'm just going to let you guys take it away. So go for it. Great. Hello, everyone. Um, so Laura and I do the same job and we kind of work with about 50-50 with the Platt agents. I've been in the business for a long, long time. I don't tell how many years um, because I started at 12. So this is all I know. Um, and I, I like to be an extension of your team when we work together. Laura, you wanna say something? Yeah, so um, I've been with First American for 17 years. I've been doing this for 18. So feels like a long time. Um, and it's really all I know too, but, uh, but I know a lot about it. So um, we're happy to help you guys. And um, Cheryl and I work really well together on the Platt account. There's just so many of you and we want to make sure that you guys, um, you know, get the best service possible. So, um, so yeah, so we kind of work together and we're going to um, go through some title training with you guys. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And then Cheryl and I are just gonna kind of go together. So hold on one second while I find the right. And feel free to ask us questions at any time. That's the best way to learn. And it might um, also direct us in something that may be more useful to you. Yeah, and guys, I'll be monitoring. monitoring that word is hard to say. Monitoring watching, us? <laughs> yes, I'll be watching the chat um, if you guys wanna drop your questions in there and then I'll make sure they get asked. Okay. I apparently accidentally closed out my training. So um, hold on one second. <laughs> okay, here we go. So can you tell us um, a little bit like Gigi, John, and um, each one of you, like what experience you have so we know if you're brand new or if you're seasoned? Yeah, we can go through and I can have everyone do a little intro. Um, guys, I'll just call on you. And if you could say your name, how long you've been at Platt, or how long you've been in real estate. Um, and that, let us, I, that gives us an idea of what we need to hit on more. Yeah, that's perfect. Natanya, you want to go first? Hi, I'm Natanya. Um, I've been in real estate, well, I'm officially since Friday. Congratulations. Thank Woo -hoo. You. <laughs> um, John, you want to go next? I've been, uh, I joined Platt last May. I'll be an uh, agent two years in September. Perfect. Jenny Bless, I feel like they're well aware of who you are, so oh. I'm going to skip over you. Jenny's just trying to critique us, we know. <laughs> she is. <laughs> um, Gigi, you want to go? Hi, I'm Gigi. I've been with Platt since September, so about five months, and I'm not actually a real estate agent, or at least not yet anyway. Um, I'm one of their community managers. We're opening a new office in the Bottleworth District, and so I'll awesome. be, yeah, but it's really helpful to still learn about all this, so looking forward to the session. Okay. Leslie? Hi. They, I know both of them, but um, I've been with Platt for two years and I just got my license. Actually, it'll be a year next month. So, And she's doing great. <laughs> Perfect. Jacob? Hello. I've been with Platt uh, as a realtor since December-ish. Okay. Yep. Lisa? She might just be listening in. Lisa has been with us for, gosh, six? Oh, my God. I actually have no idea. Um, yeah, between six months and a year. Okay. So we're there. Um, Brent, do you want to go? Sure. Um, I've been, let's say, hanging around the Platt team since about October, November. Um, not yet licensed, but I'm very, very close. Okay. Awesome. Cameron? Hi, it's Cameron. Um, I am going into my third year. Perfect. Thanks, Cam. And Eric? Yes, I have been with Platt and a realtor for about eight months now. Perfect. Okay. 
All right. So a broad spectrum of experience. So hopefully you will all get a little something out of this. Um, we tried not to make it too beginner Title 101. So for the newer agents, if you do need um, additional 101 from us to go into more depth, we would be happy to do so, okay? Um, we start by doing a title search on our end and that starts with you agents letting us know what you need, whether it's a prelim at the beginning of the listing or whether you have a buyer and an accepted purchase agreement. So when we start the search with the title, it starts with the search at the courthouse, the county records. Um, we check for bankruptcies, we check taxes, we check for judgments and liens that affect that property, but we also check for judgments that affect that seller that could also affect anything that they own. And that's a misconception that a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, divorce can create a judgment. There are several things that can create a judgment, whether it be um, a charge card, a medical bill, um, numerous things that can actually show up on title work that sometimes are a surprise to the seller and everyone. We do have a lot of common name issues. So um, like my name, Cheryl Davis, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that shows up. That doesn't mean that it's me. So we have a process that we go through that is our curative and they do a scrubbing process. They address anything that is part of the transaction or anything that should be removed from our title work. They order the payoffs, they order the deeds, surveys. Um, one thing that I wanna mention about surveys, we do not do the boundary surveys, we only order the location surveys. Um, so if a client wants a boundary survey, we can provide you with information, um, but that has to be ordered direct because it's very costly um, and they usually have people sign a contract for that. So um, in this process, you will understand what we need and what we ask for. We need a seller's authorization to be able to order payoff um, with social security number, account number, signature. We also need to know if um, somebody is deceased. For some reason in Indiana, they don't record death certificates. I know they do in other states. People think that we should know. That is something we don't know. So the more information that we get, the better um, that we can scrub our files and know what we're looking for. Now, if it's the only owner of a property and there's an estate filed, obviously we'll pick that up. Um, but there are a lot of times when a death certificate is, you know, it's out there, but we don't have any public access to that. Um, so that's one thing that I always mention. Also, if you have a split, that's recent or you're planning on doing a split, we have no way to know that too without you telling us that, okay? Um, so these are some of the things that at the beginning of the phase are very helpful to us and will help us in this process of scrubbing, knowing what we're dealing with in that our title process. Does all that make sense to everyone? That's it. Okay. Um, I'm in really quick if I can. Yes. You had mentioned preliminary title work earlier. And so preliminary title is basically where we run title work on the property and we just put the buyer as to be determined with a fake sales price in. But um, it's something that we, we do offer as a service. There is a cost to us to do it. So we ask that you don't do, run it on everything and you know all of that. But if you are running prelim because your client has said that they had a bankruptcy in the past or maybe there is a, a deceased person um, or they, they say that they have some, some issues with judgments. I mean, definitely if you're taking a listing, you know, talk to us about maybe running preliminary title, especially if the seller is giving you clues that there could be some issues on the title work. Cause we want to make sure that we get that started and start to work on clearing those issues before you get a buyer, preferably, although with this market, you might have a buyer before we ran the order, but still just getting a head start on that is really helpful. Um, and then the most common thing that I see that sellers are not aware of that they think that they are handling outside of closing is taxes. So if they've got a tax warrant against them or a federal tax lien, maybe it's on a business they own and they're making payments on it. Yeah. A lot of times they don't realize that that's going to have to be paid when they go to sell the property. So that's something to kind of keep in mind too, if your clients ever mention anything about tax liens. 
Okay, and so that's income taxes mm -hmm. that Laura's referring to, but we also have a big issue with property taxes. If somebody mentions that they purchase a property at tax sale, we need to run prelim because that property could um, not be insurable. So it's real important if they give you any indication of any strange things, um, you give one of us a call so we can talk to you about it and advise you which direction we need to go. Right. Well, my computer's sending me a, sorry, a backup. <laughs> um, so in this process, we, we do the title work first, then we do the scrubbing. And hopefully we've got everything good by the time that we schedule the closing. And at that point, our closers will take all the information from both agents, the lender, buyer, seller, um, any invoices that come in, the closing packages, and put that together. <clears throat> So that process, and it, it does require at least a hundred times, a uh, hundred steps and they change things a bunch too. So if you agents get a preliminary closing statement, please review it, check it out. The number one thing that we see that's not checked the most, you guys will not believe, but it's your commission splits. So that's really important um, to make sure that you're getting paid the right amount. If you let that go through the whole closing process, it becomes a little more difficult to correct that. It's much easier to correct prior to the closing. Um, so you don't want to rely on everything to be hundred percent accurate. We're all human. Um, just make sure that everything's good. If you do have home warranties, we need those invoices. Um, if you have any repair bills that need to be added to the closing statement, we need those invoices. Don't wait until the closing is scheduled. Get that to us and we add things to the file so we're ready. So if the lender is asking for prelim um, CDs and closing statements, all of that will already be disclosed because every now and then we don't have those invoices till the last minute. And then the lender has a problem with it because they didn't know prior to that point when they were disclosing things. So even though it doesn't affect the buyer side, it sometimes affects the lenders. So keep that in mind, okay? There are two different forms of a policy. There's an owner's policy, which protects the buyer, that everything prior to them purchasing the property has been cleared. They're getting clear title to that property with no liens or encumbrances and have access to that property. And then the lender or the loan policy protects the lender. Even if you do a cash or a land contract, the buyer receives an owner's policy. Laura, do you have something you need to add to anything? No, I think that's good. I actually have a question. The, um, the loan policy, mm -hmm. I didn't know that that existed. How is that different than private mortgage insurance or is it the same thing? It's totally different. Private mortgage insurance protects the lender if the buyer defaults. And the loan policy that we send to the lender protects them and, and shows that they're in first lien position. So there's nobody that's in front of them. Uh, so the it. difference is the owner's policy actually insures the buyer or the owner of the property. Mm -hmm. um, and it ensures that they have free and clear title provided, you know, except for taxes or any mortgages they took out. Uh, but then the lender's policy, it literally, I mean, its sole purpose is to ensure that that lender has first lien position of that mortgage. So if you stop making payments, they can foreclose. So um, we get this question a lot and a lot of people think it's the same, but no, I mean, one is insuring the lender and one is insuring the owner. That's great. Um, we had a question from Natanya come in as well, and she says, if you have a client with a list of properties they're looking for title search on, um, but it is not a prelim, what is the typical cost? Um, well, it depends on the county that mm -hmm. we do that in, but we do charge for that. That's not something that, you know, we just run a bunch of searches because like Laura mentioned earlier, all of those do cost us. So it's going to depend on the county that we're running that in. If they're um, residential, you're going to look at between around 200 to 300, depending yes. on the county um, in Indiana. And if they're commercial, those are going to be quoted based upon each project. So that'll, that would have to be something that I would have to get a quote or Cheryl would have to get a quote from our commercial department. But those usually start at 500 on commercial. Yeah. But that is not customary that a buyer would search a bunch of properties um, before they you know, enter into a purchase agreement because part of the purchase agreement is that they're getting clear title. 
So we don't run into that quite often. Okay, I think we're done with this one. Okay, so can you guys see the second slide here? All right, so um, we have a secure portal um, and about a year or two ago, I can't keep track of time, but we launched it to your buyers and sellers. So it first launched to the buyers and sellers because we wanted a secure way to um, transfer information, wiring instructions, social security numbers, all that information. So we did create a secure portal where, where we can communicate with your buyers and sellers. But the one piece that was missing was the agent piece because you guys couldn't see what was going on. Um, and it was really kind of just us and them talking about this stuff, but you, you really were kind of cut out of the loop a little bit. So we added an enhancement to the agent piece. So now you guys have your own account and you can see all of your, um, your properties and you can see documents and everything else. So I'm gonna exit out of this really quick and then I'm gonna go into um, a quick demo for you. So if you'll bear with me. And while she's doing that, you guys can even send us emails through that process securely and upload things securely. So if it's, you know, the sellers can send things securely, buyers can send things securely and now the agents can as well. New share. Okay, I'm figuring it out. She's the one to do that. As you see, it took me a minute just to get into the calls. <laughs> She's okay, our techie so girl. <laughs> you can see a screen that says, welcome to Secure Portal. Hello, Rachel. Yes. Look at me, I'm doing it. Okay, all right. So um, this is kind of when you get, uh, when you first close with First American, you're gonna receive a registration email to log into the Secure Portal. So some of you may have already gone through this. Um, but anyway, so you'll go, you'll get this email, you'll click register your account. It's going to take you to our end user license agreement, you'll accept that. Um, it's going to double identify you. So it's going to give you a link. So you're going to, you know, you're going to identify whichever phone number you want it to, you're going to say, you know, text me a code. Um, and then it's going to go through the process and you're going to end up getting your code. And then it's going to take you to where you create an account right here. So pretty simple. Um, and then submit. So once you do that, then all of your transactions um, moving forward will go into this portal. So when you log into your portal initially, this is what you're going to see. Um, you're going to see a list of all of your transactions um, open and then closed. Um, so if you click on your open transaction, so we'll just click on 192 South Stone Avenue. Um, it's going to bring you into the kind of the property page. Um, what I like about this is it has this little questionnaire here for you to fill out for each file. So if you click start on that, it's going to walk you through some questions. So it's going to want you to review and update your contact information, which Believe it or not, sometimes that, you know, email, we might have different, something like that. So you want to just verify that information. Um, and then it's also going to ask you to complete information for your buyer or seller, depending on who you're representing. Um, and one thing that's nice is when you do complete this information for your buyer, if we didn't already have that before, it will launch the portal to them so they can complete their portion of the documents. Um, and then Commission, obviously that's a big issue. You know, it's probably one of our biggest issues is just getting incorrect commission or not having commission. So this is just another place for you to confirm your commission. Um, will there be a transaction fee? Yes, no. Um, are there any inspection invoices? This is a way for you to um, say yes or no and then upload them. Is there anything else you would like us to know? This is where you can put notes in, you know, buyer's gonna be signing out of state, needs a witness, or seller needs the power of attorney, and things like that. And then at the end of it, you just kind of completed your questionnaire for that property. You've given us a ton of information, and now you kind of just get back to the beginning. So it tells you on this file below, you know, now what's going on. So buyer email phone collected has been done. Has the buyer registered for the portal? Yes. Have they completed their question and answer questions? Yes. Um, and then below that um, is just some additional information that will be coming up. 
Um, it's got your estimated closing date of April 29th up here. And then it's also got this secure messaging where if you click on that, it's going to bring up any secure messages, which this one is just a welcome email. Um, but you know, if we were to converse with you during throughout the portal or you wanted to email us through the portal, we could we could email back that way. Um, but keep in mind that actually doesn't come to Laura and I. No. It goes to our curative team. So if you're trying to send a message to us, text, email is still the way for us. Yes. Yeah, this portal goes straight to our team that that orders all of the the documents and uploads the invoices and everything else um so then you also have like a documents tab which this is going to be your document repository and you can see you know you've got a settlement statement you know to review um you just click on that it's going to automatically populate that for you so um so it's pretty exciting because it's also a way for you to store your documents and just have access to all of this post closing as well um but then it's just pretty intuitive it's very simple to use you can kind of if you can tell, I'm just moving around lots of different areas. There's, I can go to a file here, I can go at the top, you know, there's just lots of different areas. So I'm trying to think if there was any other bells and whistles to show you on this. I don't think so. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. The one thing that's great for the buyer side um, is they can get the wiring instructions this way in the most secure manner as well. So people can use this as much or as little as they like. Mm -hmm. but it is very helpful to buyers, sellers, and agents if they utilize all of it. It's, it's great, excellent feature. And it's similar to a hospital platform or mortgage company platform. So it's the most secure manner that we have of sending and receiving delicate information. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Any questions about the portal? Okay. All right, let me switch back really quick. One thing okay. I wanna to add to with a secure portal, and we're gonna go over costs first later, we do not have access to your passwords or your account personally. It's all secure for you. So every now and then I'll get a phone call like, hey, I need help with this and I'm like, I, I don't have access to your information. So keep that in mind. I know we all have a million passwords and everything, but um, it's secure in the yeah. fact that we don't even have access to your information. And right. like you're you kinda, sending us that information through that. Through you have that to go system. through the forget password area and all of that. So, which so, is pretty simple. I've done it. We have a great way to deposit funds. I think you need to scroll up a little bit. Um, it's our Zakam account. So if any of you do online banking, which I deposit checks online all the time, um, it's an awesome feature. They can just take a picture of the check using this app and it will upload. We also need them to take a picture of the first page of the purchase agreement. So if clients know that, I just tell them take a picture on their phone of the first page of the purchase agreement because we need a way to connect that to our file. They will select our title company and the office that they're working with, if they don't know which office they can collect, you know, use any of the, you know, Indiana offices and that will get to us. But it's an app on your phone that, you know, it's just a really simple process that they go through to send us their earnest money. What I do want to add, this is not a way to send closing costs. We have a good funds law that we still have to follow all the rules for the good funds law. Um, and I have had people want to send their their um, closing money this way and the closing funds cannot be sent through the Zocom account. Just keep that in mind. But you agents can use this or your clients can use this. It's so simple. It's just a couple clicks. Any Hi, this is such a dumb question, but as far as I know, most of the earnest money runs through plot at the moment. Are agents, can they just decide like who they run earnest money through, whether it's plot or well, some of yours we do hold. It depends on how short the uh, process is or what the buyer dictates. Um, but most of yours are. But occasionally that will happen that they use this. And if they're wanting to wire earnest money, um, they usually use us too rather than you guys for wires. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Okay. So it really makes no difference if you decide Platt or First American hold your earnest money. 
Well, I mean, usually it is the listing agent, but there are some stipulations um, and we what those stipulations are. I think it's a shorter time frame, maybe, um, or if we know that they're sending more than what they're going to need, they usually have us hold it. Um, like I had one, somebody sent $20,000 earnest money, which is crazy to me um, that the buyer would do that. The seller demanded it, but it was a cash deal and they wanted a big chunk down. Um, but we do on some of them. I have a lot of independent realtors that have their own brokerages that don't have an escrow account. So they always require, you know, that we hold um, mm -hmm. banks like Bank owned properties always require hot deals, always require a title company to hold earnest money. So it's a lot of those um, like investment type properties or distressed properties that we see it most often. And one thing that I've noticed too is sometimes we have like where the commission is actually less than the earnest money, like on those right. lower end properties. So in those cases, a lot of times we hold the earnest money so that they don't have to bring us a check because otherwise we're asking the broker to bring us money, you know? Right. So, um, so I've seen it there too. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Thanks guys. But we do on some of yours, but as, as a majority, Rosie, you're correct that Platt usually does, um, but Leslie's correct for sale by owners. Yes. Um, it's better for us to hold them in that circumstance. Yes. Thanks Leslie. Um, but it's a real easy way to do it rather than people running checks to our offices. They can, you know, obviously if it's a huge earnest money check, um, wire is still the good way to, um, but it's a real simple process and people love this. Mm -hmm. Especially right now when it's so cold out, nobody wants to run a check anywhere, just take a picture and go. <laughs> okay, um, any questions about Zocam actually before we move on? Any more questions? No? All right, so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna talk about costs first. I did put a flyer on here, but we're really gonna just kind of dig in to it also. So I'm gonna just, um, actually Cheryl, why don't you give a quick update while I search for how to get in there? <laughs> okay, so you will sign up on your desktop first. You can actually upload your picture. You can put your logo on it. You can customize it as much as you want. Um, and then once you get everything set up on your desktop, then there is a mobile app and it's amazing. So when you guys are out and about, say that you're going to a listing appointment and you've prepared a seller's net sheet and you have it all ready to go, you're gonna save it. And when you go meet with that client, you can actually access it on your phone. If you need to make a change, text it to him, email it to them. So it's it's amazing. You guys are gonna love it. We love it. Yes, I love it. And this it. is, cost first is used to determine title net. costs? Yes. Net sheet. So, yeah, title costs, it will automatically populate our costs, but it's also, I mean, the number one reason to use it is for a seller net sheet. Yes. Um, and they do have buyer costs on here and things like that, which I'll show you, but I, I don't love them. And, um, and we tell people not to rely on them to use because everything is affected, you know, by their credit, the rates, um, and it could change drastically on the buyer side for a quick glance. It's okay for the buyer side. Right. So I, I just, Logged in. Sorry, I did that without telling you. Um, your there's phone. a picture of me from when I started at this company. I, don't <laughs> have to get off of it. I have emailed so many people at IT <laughs> to see how I get this old photo <laughs> out of there. He's a baby. When I upload it, it won't change. It's, I don't know, it's some corporate <sighs> nightmare. Um, okay, so cost first. So we log in and it's going to take you kind of to this dashboard. Um, so like, we said there's a buyer net sheet um, on here. I don't like that because it takes a national average of buyer clothing costs. That's not gonna be very helpful no. if you've got a buyer. So I would just lean on your lender partners for those types of fees. Title fees are pretty standard across the board. You're gonna be like within 50, hundred bucks. So it's a lot easier for them to guess our fees on a buyer net sheet than it is for us to guess their fees on a buyer net sheet. Cause there's just too many variables on the loan. Correct. Um, so with that being said, I don't use it and I don't recommend you use it because I think you'll Not just get frustrated and just get bad information. So um, so what we generally do is we go into the seller net sheet here. So there's a couple different options for seller net sheets. We've got a seller net sheet, seller multiple offers sheet, and a net first calculator. So what I like about the 
seller multiple offers is obviously in this market, you guys are seeing that right now. You might have five offers that you have to sort through. So this is really nice to work through those offers without having to rekey in information that's standard for every single net sheet. Um, and then the net first calculation, that's if you've got a seller that's like on the fence, maybe about listing and they're saying, you know, I'll list with you, but I have to net 30 grand. So this is a good way to kind of work the sheet backwards to like to find out what you need to sell the property for for him to net the 30 grand so it's just a different way of doing the math um refinance net sheet that doesn't apply to you quick quotes if you want to just get our title and closing fee and just look at those two things you can do that there but it doesn't have all of our processing fees or anything else so it's really just the insurance premium and the closing fee that's kind of a lender feature uh, yeah. lenders yeah. use that more um rent versus buy this is kind of a fun um, thing that you guys can play around with and it'll bring up, you know, how much would you pay for rent versus buying and it might be something that you might be able to put together for a, a first time home buyer that's on the it's fence. It's great to buying. use for um, a marketing tool to send out to like apartments or something too. Mm -hmm. And then short sale net sheet. So this is if you are working with a seller who owes more than the home is worth and you're working with their lender to do a short sale. I would recommend contacting us instead of doing your own net sheet. Um, just let us do a settlement statement. It's going to be more accurate and it's going to make the process a little bit better. So, um, but anyways, that's kind of all of the, the different functionalities of cost first um, and then, or the different net sheets available. And then we're going to just kind of go in really quick and I'm going to show you um, a quick seller net sheet. So when you click on seller net sheet, it's going to pull you into this screen. So I'm going to prepare this for Rosie and Rosie's going to, oh wait, I need an actual address. I'll use my address. Okay. Yeah, now you guys know where she lives. Now you know where I live. <laughs> um, but what the reason I wanted to use an actual address is because I wanted to show you that it pulls in the taxes. How yes, cool it's that? awesome. Just type in the address. I normally do one, two, three Main Street, but it wasn't going to show you that cool feature. So anyways, so I put in my address. It pulls in the taxes. I love that. Um, sales price, we'll just put in 200. Buyer's loan type. If you don't know, I would just put in conventional. That's what I always leave it as. Um, but you can always change that here if you want. Um, estimated settlement date. That is always going to be pretty much 30 days after so the 10th it must have been that the eighth's on a weekend or something so it's going to pull that next business day to pull up about 30 days out so obviously you can change that by clicking on this is what it's using for the tax proration at this yeah. point correct so this is what it's using so i'm going to change it to the 31st of march um loan to be paid or assumed let's just say i owe a hundred thousand on this nice world um and then so you put that in there and then it's got your annual property tax listed in there. That's the year that the taxes were available. So when we get to tax time, this might get a little tricky because we might be pulling in something different than what's available like immediately at the county. So just around tax time, that might be a little weird to see whether they're paid or unpaid or what. Um, one thing that I wanna point out too that we run into a snag a lot on too with the taxes. So in April, we're gonna assume May is paid. If your mm -hmm. seller hasn't paid that, then you'll need to add down at the bottom of the second page. Um, and so October, we think November is paid too, because they're normally paid a month prior when you have a mortgage. So our system assumes that, okay? Correct. If the closing date is after May 10th, which is when taxes are due, the system automatically thinks that those taxes are paid current. Yes. So if your seller is like an investor and they just want to pay them at closing, well, this net's going to be off because we're going to have to add an additional six months of taxes that they didn't right. pay that the system thought was paid. So that's what I was saying about the tax time. Just it's you kind of just I would always add another if you're unsure, just add it in there and it would be great yes. if, if the seller doesn't have to pay those taxes. Wonderful. But it would be better than not disclosing half a year as taxes. Or if you've got questions, just call me and Cheryl and we'll just walk through you know, the best option for that seller based on all the different factors. So, right. um, okay, so closing costs. So this kind of defaults that the buyer pays the closing costs, but I know a lot of times we see that it's split. So you can change that there to be split and it's gonna split our closing fee out. Um, 
same generally the seller pays for the owner's policy so that just automatically goes here but again you can always change that um, generally the buyer pays the lender's policy so it it automatically populates in our fees um and kind of some standard fees too so obviously we know commissions negotiable so this could very well change maybe you know you only did three three on this one so you can change that there um the seller cpl that's one of our fees home warranty this is again this is just like an average so you can change that i know they're generally more like 550 um so you can change that there search and exams our fee hoa transfer fee i don't have an hoa so i can delete that um seller paid cc this is seller paid closing costs so let's just say i'm going to give three thousand dollars to the buyer towards closing costs that's where i can add that there um, if you had a transaction fee, you can enter that there. Um, other, you know, you can put, let's just say, I think the taxes. That, that's where you'd want to put like the taxes. Yeah, let's just do um, spring taxes. So you can put that there. Um, and then over here, this is kind of, this is if, this is like back in the day. If you're, um, back in the day, sellers and buyers used to negotiate, like you're gonna pay my appraisal and I'm gonna pay this and I'm gonna pay that. So we don't see this as much. We normally see that $3,000 credit type of thing. Yes. But if you wanted to really get detailed about all of this, you could do that here. Um, corrective work, a lot of times people put in inspection, like if you're doing a seller net and you think that the house needs some work and you know that it's probably gonna need a couple thousand dollars worth of inspection repair work, you can put that in here too, just to kind of at the, um tone with the seller that that's probably something they need to to worry about right um but anyways with all that said and done um you've got your total costs your estimated tax preparations and then here's your seller net the 74 466 85. you can text it to someone it's a really like snippety little it's not a lot of information it's it just kind of gives it's them it's more net. of like a snapshot i would say like a yeah, snapshot, snapshot. Little um, so yeah, so I don't love the text feature, but I mean, it's definitely there. My preferred feature is the detailed estimate um, okay. because it just, which I don't know, can you see it? It's coming up. It, it came okay? up and then it went to print. Okay. Oh, here we go. Do there you see is. that? Look, see, there's a different picture. I've changed it places. I just, I can't get it all the way out. <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> okay. So, um, so, yeah, so this just kind of breaks it all down for you. And then okay. I think you've got a place for your seller to sign and date to have save it so they can see where you save it and then go back into it. Oh, okay. So you want to save up here, all options, save. And say so it gives you the it's file is saved, has been saved. And then when I open, if you want to open it, these are all the different ones that I've done in the past. So you can just find it in there. And obviously I need to delete some, but- um, I have a bunch in mine too, I think. Well, it's been a long career here. <laughs> you can go back in and edit. So it's an awesome feature. And like yes. I was saying earlier, you can have it all prepared on here and then you can make any changes on your phone of the same net sheet. And then um, just really quick, I'm just, I just popped over to the multiple offers one. Goodness gracious. And what I like about this one is that, like I said, you put in a little bit of information and um, you just go to next offer. Oh, wait, what did I do? Well, anyways, it, it just got me all that same information. It's like really nice because it, uh, I did it wrong. You can do up to 10 offers. You can even use this as a countering type of thing if they need to see a side by side comparison as to what's the offer they gave us and how we want to counter back. It's a great little side by side tool. Okay, now I'm going to go to next offer. I didn't have a sales price and I think it, I confused it. Um, but anyways, what you'll see now is that Rosie's name is in there, the address is in there, the taxes are in there. Everything's rekeyed in except for that contract information so it's just it's nice to be able to see them all at once and then you can even like 
print, and then you can see all of the different net sheets. So there's definitely different functionality if you want a detailed estimate or quick estimate, you know, a multiple offer estimate. Um, it'll pull up different views that you can share with your clients. See, like this one has, you know, offer one. I didn't really go into offer two, but it would break it down there for you. And it shows it just like that offer one. And then mm -hmm. it's awesome because basically it's showing, you know, what they offered for the price and the bottom line, not all the meets in between. And most, okay. most people get confused by all the details anyway. They think that the highest sales price is always the highest bottom line, which we all know is not true, depending on what they're asking for. Yeah, it's true. Any questions about costs first? I know we're going over a lot today, so I'm sorry. This is such okay. an amazing tool. It is. Oh, it's, it's so the, wonderful. It's awesome. Okay. All right. Let me just, we're almost done. Um, I want to go back to, okay. All right. Okay. We're going to let Cheryl uh, take it away. We're going to go over a settlement statement. Okay, go ahead and go to the next page. Yep. So we have a little cheat sheet that we have, and then each one of these, it's going to be specific for your transaction, the property address, the buyer, the seller's name, the lender, the closing date. So you're starting out, number one is the sales price, and you're gonna see that on both sides, obviously, because it needs to balance out. Number two is the buyer's loan amount, and then you'll see the earnest money under number three. You will also see that on the next page if the listing agent is um, holding the earnest money, okay? Do you right. see that? So it's the commission minus the earnest money. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we can go back. Sorry, we hop around a little bit because I like to explain it why I'm doing this. The taxes, um, and seller's credit and all the prorations are going to be here. So HOA taxes, seller credit, but the taxes will show up in three spots. This is the most confusing um, because you're going to see it here. You're going to see it in the lender's escrow, which is the next page right here. And then you will also see it down at the bottom. We'll show if we're paying it or if it's already paid. Oh, sorry. You're fine. So, mm, here we go. There it is. There it is, the POC. That means paid outside of closing, okay? So I just wanna point that out. If we're collecting an installment, it'll be here. If that recent installment has been paid, it's gonna show there. So it goes in a big circle. The seller gives the buyer money, the buyer gives the lender money, and then the remainder is the credit for future. So it's a little bit tricky, um, but I like to explain that all at once. Hopefully that makes sense. And the credits are just flat credits like that. So $3,000, they used to make us show them broken down and put a little asterisk next to each one of them, which was a nightmare. We had to run a, <laughs> a calculator tape to make sure that they were getting the full credit. And if mm -hmm. they made one little change that messed everything up. So this is good. They can see the exact amount that they're getting as a credit. And then number five are all of your lenders fees, the processing, the interest, the appraisal, the credit report, the flood certification, any upfront MIP, um, all of that's going to be in one chunk. And I like these new changes on how that shows because it's real simple and easy to see all those fees bundled together. Mm -hmm. And then you have the escrow setup. So your buyers get very confused because they're like, well, taxes are paid and I just paid for a year of an owner's policy, or I'm sorry, a homeowner's insurance policy. So why do I need this? Well, this is a budget to pay next year and they wanna pay it at least a month in advance to make sure that everything's paid. So you'll always see at least three months in escrow for any escrow account, if not more. So they can be prepared to pay the next installment that's coming due. And then number seven are all of our title fees and they make us break it out like this too with the title insurance, the processing fees, the closing protection letter, the TIF fees. Some of those are dictated by the state and some of those are the actual title company's fees. 
And then you have the commission. Please make sure it's correct. As you will see, there's no percentages to tell you what it is. So you need to know that you're getting the correct amount. And then you have the recordings. So all of those are lumped together. The seller's payoff is under number 10. And then miscellaneous will be the taxes that we talked about showing the deed preparation. If there's any um, invoices that are being paid, those will be in here as well. And then like transaction fees. So those are all in the miscellaneous section. And then the bottom line you will see is not the actual bottom line, which to me is kind of crazy. So you bump it back up. They're just making sure that you see that they balanced. So you're going to have this amount is due from the seller, or I'm sorry, due to the seller, and this amount is from the buyer. So you want to look at that to see. Um, so it's either up a line or two lines, depending on if you're dealing with the buyer or the seller. It used to be old school way when I was doing, when I was a closer, the bottom line was the very bottom line. So they just <laughs> added in another thing to throw us all off. Mm -hmm. But any prorations are going to show up on both sides as a debit and a credit to make that balance. Any questions on this? I know we hopped around a little bit, but I like to do that so you guys understand it. That's how we do it at closing too, just to I keep know. you on your toes. <laughs> yes. Okay, now back to the third page, now back to the first page. <laughs> okay, third page. No, I'm just teasing. Oh, <laughs> I'm good. I'm getting it over here. <laughs> yeah. So the little cheat sheet, though, explains. So if you guys need the cheat sheet, if you're new at this, this is very helpful because you know where to look for everything. Rosie, I'll send you um, the file that has all these flyers in it for you to disseminate, if that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, guys, can you talk through for agents um, what they should prep their clients for as they're heading into closing? Like any conversations that they should have with their clients before they walk into that closing yeah. room? So we have designated spots for the buyers and sellers. If it's a first time home buyer, I would also make sure that your lender um, can attend the closing to sit next to them because that's who they're going to have most of the questions for. And I tell all new agents and even seasoned agents, Jenny, and I've probably told you too, everybody has a lane. I don't know your real estate part of it. I don't know the lenders part of it. We know enough to be able to do our jobs, but everybody has their own role. So um, if it is a first time home buyer, you definitely want the lender in there and they'll sit next to them and help take that pressure off of you to answer all those questions. If there is anything that they are questioning, that's a good time to do it. Also, you can request a whole package ahead of time. If a seller is, if you have an engineer or a litigator, let us know. They want everything ahead of time. It'll be much more of a smooth closing for all parties if we can get stuff to them ahead of time to review. Um, so as, you're, as you know your client, make those adjustments. Um, if anyone is expecting a phone call that could be a family emergency or related to like the mover or something, let people know that ahead of time because people get really upset if somebody's phone rings during a closing. And it, you know, if people know that a call's coming, it just adds for a better situation. Um, and also, um, if a seller needs to bring funds to the closing, we do that ahead of time too, to get them prepared for what they need to bring. So they, as well as the buyer know ahead of time, because the buyer's getting their information from the lender. So we'll make sure the seller gets um, information ahead of time from us. And they need a valid government issued ID. Yes. If it expired last week, we will make you go to the DMV. It's happened. Yes. <laughs> I don't love it, but it has to be valid. So that is something that is a small thing, but it happens more often than you realize that people yes. show up to closing and their driver's license is expired and it holds up everything. So just something, a friendly reminder to your client. Or their name doesn't match. You know, they got married. They didn't mm -hmm. change it. They need to do that. It can even be the paper um, that they provide at the BMV because it's still legitimate. It's all stamped and everything, mm -hmm. but it needs to be current and match in the names. Yes. whether it's the buyer or the seller. That's good. Any other questions that somebody might have? No? I think we're good guys. Well, we appreciate your time. Um, Laura and I both have a team we wanted to mention um, that 
We are in the process of finalizing our teams. And so we will have new information going to you that hopefully will um, get information streamlined a lot better from the beginning to the closing process. One single point of contact yes. in all of the offices. <laughs> Who wouldn't love that? I'm excited. <laughs> we are. We can't wait. We're almost yeah. to that point of finalizing it. Yeah. That hopefully by merge. Guys. Yeah. Love it. That's awesome. Um, guys, tomorrow, Tuesday, we have an, uh, an agent panel. We're talking about open houses. So on that panel, we're going to have Amy Jones, Dan McNeil, and Laura Bora. So hope you can join and have a great day, everyone. Happy Monday. Thank you all for attending. Bye. Thanks for having us. Cheers.